OK, hello everyone. I've started letting some people in. Uh, we're going to give just a couple of minutes to uh, let in a few more people that might be showing up a couple minutes late before Ellie starts. Um, thank you for showing up to our third uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, these HUD grant fundamentals series are, are really important to us here in the city and to help um, new prospective nonprofits as well as existing nonprofits kind of get a handle on what's expected of them with, with HUD uh, federal dollars. So um, this uh, presentation today will be on program financial management. Um, Ellie, uh, our new grants finance specialist, that's that's the correct title, right, Ellie? Grants finance compliance specialist. Compliance I I have specialist. to do all four. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was it's missing rough. something. <laughs> yeah, I, I barely learned it. <laughs> yeah, she, she's uh, our newest member of the team and we're excited to have her present today. So with that in mind, looks like a couple more people are joining, but I'll sort of let Ellie start with her uh, introduction. I don't think anyone's going to miss anything in the first minute, particularly. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, well, thanks for for coming. Uh, this is the third in a series, as Alex mentioned. Uh, we've got a timeline here. We've already gone over the home grants and CDBG grants, and now we're getting into this kind of overarching idea of program financial management. A lot of what we're going to discuss is stuff that is kind of a basic best practices for accounting and financial management for any federal funds and really for any kind of grant accounting. And some things are going to be done um, more uh, specifically to if you receive CDBG or home funds. Um, but again, it's just an overview. And I do want to just say that I am always uh, very open to talking to any of you uh, directly, like over email or your phone call, um, because I think that a successful grant program just needs to have that kind of coordination, especially because one of the basic things that we're going to talk about is that all of these funds are on a reimbursement basis. So you are going to incur the costs ahead of the city reimbursing you, and I don't want any kind of miscommunication there where uh, if program funds aren't um, done properly that we wouldn't be able to reimburse you for those expenses. So I think it's always a matter of how do we figure out how to be in communication ahead of time. Um, so we're going to go over the always exciting um, uh, accounting uh, issues of internal controls, accounting records, allowable costs, source documentation, budget controls, cash management, reporting, and some other regulations. And uh, I think Alex put this in the chat, but if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And at the end, there will be a period of time for any kind of questions that you have, and hopefully I'll know how to answer them. So internal controls are basically the procedures and the rules that you have in place to prevent fraud, promote accountability, and to ensure the integrity of accounting and financial information overall. And they help you comply with laws and regulations and improve the accuracy and the timeliness of financial reporting. Uh, they prevent people from stealing assets or committing frauds, hopefully. So people often think of internal controls as something that's only relevant to accountants and auditors, but the important thing to understand is that management at all levels of an organization is responsible for ensuring internal controls are set up and followed and reviewed regularly, and it's a continual process. And this is one of these things that any of you that are coming from accounting already are going to be very familiar with. There are kind of specific uh, guidelines for internal controls uh, specific to federal funds, but they are in line with kind of best practices with GAAP, all of that. So, a uh, again, it's this combination of procedures and specified job responsibilities, these qualified personnel in place and records. It's about creating accountability. The idea is that you are going to have a way to uh, create accountability in an organization's financial systems and safeguard your cash, your property, and your other assets. Um, as always, 2 CFR 200, a very exciting read for almost no one, um, but it is the source on so much of what we're discussing in this training. 
and uh, we at the city are happy to help point you towards specific uh, particular resources to support you in managing these HUD grants. And a great place to start is always going to be a website called HUD Exchange, which you can find just by Googling it. Um, and they have a great overview on how to implement the five key internal controls that they identify as risk assessment, controlling the environment, controlling activities, clearing information, uh, clear information and communication, and continuous monitoring. Um, and they do have a lot of good uh, interpretation of 2 CFR 200 and all of that because it is uh, a lengthy chunk of text to, to get through. So we all struggle with it. Uh, the basic elements of internal controls uh, include, you know, an organizational chart, a written description of the functions of key employees. It's basically a formal, it's got to have formal systems of authorization and supervision. So that includes, you know, a policy manual identifying approval authority for financial track transactions, a uh, written accounting manual outlining procedures for recording deposits and expenditures. If you're a nonprofit, you likely already have some form of a board approved, you know, financial policies and procedures. Uh, again, it's about these ideas of having these written procedures outlining the steps of how to authorize financial transactions, how to record those transactions, and specifying the division of responsibilities of who does these tasks and having these clear systems of authority and supervision. Um, now, an important uh, concept in uh, internal controls is this idea of segregation of duties or separation of duties. It's the same idea, and it's the assignment of various steps in a process to different people to prevent instances in which anyone could engage in theft or other fraudulent activity. Um, beyond that, it also prevents anyone from having an excessive amount of control over a financial process, and it helps to just prevent errors and to catch the fact that we are all human and we're all going to, you know, have typos, we're all going to have mistakes. So it's not just about preventing fraud, but it is an important part. Uh, an adequate sep separation of duties is where no one individual has the authority over an entire financial transaction. So it should ensure, for instance, that no one individual could receive and process and pay an invoice from a third party without review from at least one other person in the organization. We're trying to stop the consolidation of control um, over any one um, kind of uh, procedure or transaction. So it involves a segregation of duty, involves a separation of three kinds of responsibilities, the authorization to execute a transaction, the recording of the transaction, the custody of the assets involved in the transaction, uh, some of you probably have systems like if you use something like bill.com or some kind of AP management thing that has approvals in it. If you have a check request form or something that certain people have to sign off on, um, those are some of the things that are going to be a part of the segregation of duties. But again, you should have a way of kind of stepping back and having these written policies that are looking at each element and doing that assessment of risk and thinking out how to control the environment, how to control assets, how to control activities. Uh, again, you're going to have document security. So who has access to the blank checks? Who has access to the cash? Um, you need to make sure that it's authorized personnel and that the responsibilities are clear. Um, and then beyond preventing fraud and abuse, internal controls also help your organization to decrease the risk of errors and ensure the integrity of data. So that includes things like reconciling your bank and loan statements every month uh, to ensure that your financial uh, to uh, and comparing them to your financial records. And then if you find any discrepancies between your account, between your own books and what is on your bank statements, you need to address those discrepancies. So um, that is everyone's favorite thing of reconciling. Um, we've got accounting records, and forgive me, I'm adjusting to having a PowerPoint presentation. I have to scroll under here below my uh, Teams part. So, okay, here's your quick accounting lesson. People used to track all of their accounting transactions in actual books and ledgers, which is where you get terms like bookkeeper from, but nowadays you should all probably be using an automated accounting system. and. All of the things that I'm going to cover here that are saying that these are parts of a, a necessary financial system, they are all the basic elements of any automated account system, whether you're using QuickBooks, Financial Edge, NetSuite, Sage, other things I don't know about. These, any basic program is going to have these as part of it. But um, 
parts of your financial system have to include like a chart of accounts, um, which is the classification system for all your individual accounts. So that's your bank accounts and other assets to your various categories for revenues and expenses, your loans and liabilities. Um, if you're filling out that check request form and you're telling your, uh, your accountant, like, where am I supposed to uh, code this to? That probably is part of it. Um, and then there's the cash receipts journal and cash disbursement journal. And again, in accounting speak, a journal is basically just the word for your chronological log of changes, that old ledger that you had in a book that the changes that occur from all of your financial transactions. So in simplified terms, the cash receipts journal is for all the money that you've received. Cash disbursements are all the expenses that you incur, and that means all the expenses that you have. And in each case, the term cash just refers to funds, not necessarily literal paper cash. Um, and the payroll journal is a more specific record of wages and benefits and fringe versus non-personnel expenses. Now the general ledger is what is very important to me in my role and when I'm receiving reimbursement requests, it refers to the entirety of your accounting record and all the transactions that you've posted. It records all your accounts and transactions. And the general ledger report is something that you're going to be providing monthly if you are a recipient of a city um, HUD pass through loan through us. So, and it is going to tie out, it's going to agree or match the total of what you are requesting. So for your CDBG or your home grant funds. So your general ledger should show those amounts and it should like the total there should match what you are requesting. If there's any variance, there should be a reason and we can kind of talk about that. Um, but again, your accounting system needs to be able to track the sources and uses of your funds. So you need to track the funds that you receive, your budgets, your program income earned to be able to just monitor and assess your financial picture. So if you're working on a rehab of a house, you need to be able to track the grant funds, the loans, any of your own funds that you're using. Those are your sources of funds and you need to know how you use those funds, what expenditures tied to each of those funds and the remaining balance so you need to have budgets in place. You need to be able to encumber money, which basically means you need to know that the balance in your bank account isn't all just available for you to spend, right? You might have a contract out with a contractor saying you're going to pay them, you know, 50 grand for this and you've only paid them 10 grand so far. You've got to know, like, you've got to be able to save that 40 grand to pay the rest um, because you've entered into contracts that still have outstanding payments or because you need to know that some of your money is basically saved for something else. And again, I'm trying to make this uh, presentation something, you know, between like I know some of you that are in this meeting are uh, accountants, are bookkeepers, and some of you are um, members uh, of a nonprofit. And so I know that people are coming from a variety of backgrounds. So I'm, I'm trying to bridge all the world. So forgive me for my muddled language here. Um, but our next category that I want to talk about is what are allowable costs? And this is basically the idea of like, what can you spend your grant money on? And what are we able to reimburse you on? And this is a really important concept because again, we at the city want to make sure that what you are doing is in compliance with the grant. And we also want to make sure that we're clear so that we, we know that in having a reimbursing grant, the, it, can be uh, an onus for you to put the cash out first, right? And to incur those expenses. And so we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page so that we can reimburse you and we can all be in agreement on how this grant is being expended. So an allowable cost is an expenditure, again, like just an expense that is, it's necessary, reasonable, and directly related to the grant. It's authorized by the grant agreement. It's not prohibited under federal, state, or local laws or regulations. It is consistently treated. It's allocable to the relevant program, and it properly discloses all discounts and price adjustments. And I'll go into what each of those means because they're a little bit of gobbledygook on some of them. So necessary, reasonable, and directly related. Um, there can be frustratingly few hard rules when it comes to this, other than expenses that are specifically against federal, state, or local laws or against the terms of a grant. But the basic idea is would a reasonable average person with knowledge of the activity you're doing think that your expense was prudent and ordinary? 
and necessary, right? So if you're using CDBG funds for a summer camp for kids, it would probably not seem reasonable to use a limo instead of a bus to transport them on a field trip, unless you had a really good reason. Uh, if you're buying countertops for a kitchen rehab, probably not reasonable to buy Italian marble for them. So those are kind of like, it's easier to provide the extremes. Obviously they're, you know, everything is a matter of context. Um, and again, if it's against the law, if it's not in your specific budget of your grant agreement, those are really easy. If you ever have confusion about whether something is necessary, reasonable and directly related, again, please reach out to us. Um, Another piece of this is it needs to be authorized by the grant. So you will have a grant agreement specifying the budget, specifying what any budget category is. Um, and it's really important that as we enter into a grant agreement, we will discuss a reasonable budget for your project. And it's vital that you stick to this budget and communicate with us right away if you foresee any issues in adhering to it. Um, because if you are always incurring uh, expenses before you seek reimbursement in the city, we don't want to be in a position where you went off budget without communicating with us and figuring out, you know, if there was a workaround and then you spend funds and we can't reimburse you. So you have to make sure that all expenses meet procurement requirements with documentation. Um, there are a lot of different procurement guidelines that will be discussed in depth in a separate training in April, um, but they're basically the standards and procedures you have to use before making purchases or entering into contracts using these grant dollars or using federal dollars. Some standards are in place for all purchases, Others are determined by the amount of the purchase or contract. So if you're generally, if you are spending more, there are more <laughs> rules and regulations around it, right? Um, there are some allowances for when you're going out and you're buying, you know, a pack of pens or something that you don't need to get three separate sealed bids. Um, Consistent treatment is one that's really hard <laughs> to define, uh, but it's a, it's basically an accounting principle and it refers to the accounting methods that you use for expenses and there shouldn't be one set of rules for expenses that you will use for federal funds and another set of rules for the rest. So expenditures are applied to federal grants using the same um, procedures as they are for non-federally assistant activities. And um, GAAP is generally accepted accounting principles um, that those uh, you should be using GAAP in computing your cost. So my best example that I could think of just uh, ahead of time was if you normally split the employer sponsored health care uh, for uh, your employees, um, if you normally split it by the cost of that each month by the percent of time each employee uh, spends on each program, that should remain the same whether the program is being uh, suddenly gets grant funding. So it shouldn't be that like once you get grant funding, you're saying like, actually, you know, it, that person only spends 30% of their time on this program. But now that we've got some grant funding, we're just going to say that like 90% of the, the employer sponsored health care is uh, going to be put to that, right? That whatever the source of funds, you're treating things the same, no matter whether they're federally assisted or not. Allocable to the program. Here we have the scary red text. Uh, this is about direct and indirect costs. Um, we only allow grant agreements at the city for direct costs with CDBG and home funds. There are a lot of regulations around HUD and caps on um, administrative costs and things. So our city agreements are always going to be for direct costs for CDBG and home funds. And a direct cost refers to the idea that the expense is directly related to the grant funded program. An indirect cost is those that are incurred for like a common objective that benefits more than one cost activity. So um, it's not just that cost is not just for your federally funded grant activity. Um, some people kind of think of it a little bit as overhead. It's not strictly one to one on that, but but it's a, a better way to kind of think of that. Um, it can be tricky to give concrete guidance on this because some um, categories of costs are going to be very context specific. For instance, rents and leases. So if you get an award um, through the home program to provide tenant based rental assistance, paying a client's rent is a direct cost. However, putting some of your offices lease to the home program is not a direct cost because it is very likely that you are not only administering home grants, right? Your office does more than just that. So it's not your 
so that's where we kind of get to this kind of overhead cost, this idea of like you have a cost that really contributes to a lot of different cost activities to a lot of different activities, not just the federally funded ones. And um, this would be considered an indirect cost and would be prohibited under the terms of our sub recipient agreements for these funds. Generally, things like HR, accounting, executive level salaries, your offices, rents and utilities, um, most office supplies are going to be indirect costs. And there can be some exceptions, like if you're a small nonprofit, you might have an executive director that provides actual direct services and is allocating that time on your timesheet. Um, if you purchase supplies specifically for these grant activities and not just for general office use. However, you can't do something like saying, well, a portion of our copy paper this month was probably used for the grant. Like that's where we get into kind of the trickier, the trickier level. If you're really able to kind of say like this exact amount was directly for this, then we're talking about direct uh, costs. Um, and obviously there are indirect costs and overhead to any grant funded program. Like we all recognize that uh, <laughs> funders generally want to fund the activity. Nobody wants to to like pay the electricity to keep the lights on in the office or all of that. Like we, we fully understand that. So how do you handle the extra indirect and overhead costs that are obviously incurred in doing any kind of grant funded activity? So some of our subrecipients are going to use their general funds for these indirect costs, or you could also think about using other grants for these costs, like about approaching some of your local funders or other funders um, to think about how creatively they can contribute to a program and to talk about, you know, their limits on what you can use these HUD funds for and that you want to do this project and that you need their support to be able to do that. Um, our next one has a good graphic, double billing, don't do it. Uh, the basic idea is if you say a cost went to the grant, you shouldn't be reporting whether by accident or not that that cost also went to some other grant, right? Whatever system of accounting you use, it must be sophisticated enough for you to be able to properly allocate expenses to the specific grants. So generally this means some kind of fund accounting, program-based accounting, grant-specific accounting or the like. Whatever system you use, you have to be able to account for how you prevent an expense from being allocated, I mean, being contributed to more than one grant or fund. So as a simplified example, how is your accounting system able to ensure that say a thousand bucks of one employee's wages in January went to the city's C to your city CDBG grant? And how do you ensure that that amount of wages isn't also by accident or on purpose able to be reported for a grant from a private foundation, right? So there are different ways to do this. You can use specific expense lines in your chart of account, special funds, or something like classes or customers that are associated with all of these expenses. Um, there are a lot of different ways to achieve this. The basic principle is we've just got to have some kind of system in place. Um, net of all applicable credits. This um, sounds more complicated than it is. All credits must be disclosed, including purchase discounts and price adjustments. Uh, what that basically means is whatever cost you ultimately pay is the cost you should be reporting for the grant. So if an item is like at the store for 10 bucks each, but buy three, get it for $25, you should go and you go ahead and buy three. You should only be reporting $25 for that expense. You shouldn't be saying like, well, it was three and they're $10 each. Like I'm going to report $30, right? Because in that case, you would be reimbursed for $30 off of a $25 expense. You'd be making a $5 profit and you would be committing fraud. Um, so the basic idea is like you get a discount, you get a deal on something, you have a refund off of part of it, you know, that that needs to be reflected in what you're reporting on the grant. This is a basic idea that probably all of you were already in agreement on, but it's part of our official definition, so I need to go over it. Uh, source documentation. So as always, we require lots of paperwork to be kept. Not all of it has to be turned into us all the time, but Basically, when you're using federal funds, you need to be able to, um, when questioned, be able to substantiate the use of those federal funds, right? So you need to have documentation of your expenses. So 
everything in your accounting records need to have some kind of um, so source documentation. And if you're a nonprofit and you've gone through an audit, like you know that they will pull an expense and say like, where's your receipt? Where's your invoice? What do you have? A proof of payment, things like that. So those are the basic ideas, right? Of source documentation. So it shows like, why is there a cost? When did it happen? How much was the cost? Um, and then there are two levels basically of source documentation that I think about. And one level is what you'd be providing on a monthly basis to us with your request for reimbursement. And that's going to be the kind of basic documentation of your receipts, your invoices, your timesheets, your general ledger report, and the like. There's another level of documentation that, frankly, I don't personally want to look through every single time, um, but that you need to have um, and needs to be retained even if you aren't submitting it monthly because the city periodically monitors subrecipients and reserves the right to request this sort of additional documentation at any time. Also, if you're a nonprofit, you'd be required to retain all of this. But again, these these are kind of like the next level of documentation. So it could include like for payroll costs, right? There's not just your timesheet. There's not just your, you know, your payroll ledger and all of that. You're going to have like the employment letter that shows, you know, how much this person is supposed to be paid. You're going to have records of all of your benefits, uh, your employee withholdings. If there's a union agreement, uh, written personnel policies, all of that. Um, so those are not things that we need to reimburse you, but those are levels of source documentation that are kind of like the support beyond like the immediate documentation. Um, it could include things like for supplies, you'd also need to have like the purchase orders or requisition forms, um, your proof of those kinds of internal controls of like there was another person authorizing this expenditure, um, copies of your canceled checks, uh, the you know credit card statement showing that the credit card charge was incurred, all of that. So um, you know it's it's not to frighten you to think like you need to have uh, you know like a a ridiculous level of detail, but you do need, <laughs> you do need to to keep track of your expenses. You need to have those records. Um, these are going to be basic principles if you're a nonprofit that are going to be part of your uh, annual audits if you're subject to that in Michigan. Um, and these are also just kind of best practices and should probably be in your written policies and procedures. Budget controls, this is gonna be quick, <laughs> I promise. You need to be able to manage your money. You should have a way to compare your budget to your expenses, like what you've actually, your actual costs, and as well to be able to plan, like to look at your budget balance against your planned future purchases. So if you have a construction project and you never check costs against the budget, how do you know if you're going to be able to have enough funds to complete it? If you aren't able to project future costs against the balance remaining in your funds, like the same applies. So when the city invests in your project, whether it's a construction project or a program, you know, providing support services, is, whatever it is, we want to make sure that you have the capacity and the controls in place to that, so that your pro project and your program are successful. Um, and part of that is having these basic budget controls. And the upside of our monthly reimbursement request is it forces you to have some amount of checking your budgets against your actuals um, because the reimbursement requests are structured so that you need to show what is your remaining ba um, balance on your grant dollars at least. But we're also talking about the overall budget for your projects um, overall, which may or may not be larger than just the grant funds, right? You might be using other funds as well. Uh, I referenced this already, uh, but the city, uh, these grants are reimbursing grants, which means that you incur the expenses, you pay the expenses before you get paid. So basically on a monthly basis, you would have a report of all of your expenses um, that were uh, allocable to the grant. You're going to submit that and then the city will will reimburse you for the cost of all of those expenses. So that does require some cash up front, right? So that's a thing to take in mind to take into consideration when you're thinking about your project and uh, you know what your capacity is as an organization. Program income is something that 
is relevant for some programs and projects and not so relevant for others, but it's the basic idea of any revenue that might be generated by program activities that are funded with federal funds, right? So the government is basically saying, if you use federal funds and you make a profit from it, um, then you should be using that generated profit. Like they want, they have an investment in what is being used in that. There are some, um, there are some carve outs, right, of like some of these home funds and things like that when they go to developers, all that uh, to the extent I think a lot of you in this meeting are coming from nonprofits. That's not going to apply to you, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, that is to say it's not that every single amount of revenue that is generated by grant funds is always considered program incomes. It's one of the it's is always considered program income. It's one of these things that has a very complicated definition. It's something that we would discuss ahead of time with you and that if you have any concerns, you would certainly bring it up to us. But a basic example is if we give CDBG funds for you to um, make loans for, uh, I'm going to call it one of our programs uh, for making roof repairs, for instance, like that, that the maybe you as a nonprofit are covering the cost of roof repairs, but you structure it so that it's a loan to some of your uh, clients. As you get that interest in principle paid back, that is considered program income. Now that program income needs to be applied to your program costs before you then get a reimbursement from the city and from HUD, right? So if you do engage in an activity that generates program income beyond the period of your grant, um, it would depend on the term of your grant agreement, whether it would need to be returned to the city or expended on eligible activities. But again, this is sort of a small subsection of our uh, separate recipient agreements, and we would certainly be in conversation. But if you're thinking about something like the, the very clear example is always like when you're loaning out um, when you're making loans and it's involving CDBG or home funds, then we need to think about how do we account for program income and what do we do with it? Uh, so financial reporting, and this is really about how are you reporting um, to us on your finances? Uh, I've already referred to monthly requests for reimbursements or FSRs, so you need to have the capacity to provide the following for all of your activities. You need to be able to show the amounts budgeted. Uh, you need to be uh, able to uh, to account for your revenues, your reimbursements, your program income, your actual expenditures and disbursements, your current obligations, your unpaid requests for payment, right? Your receivables, your accounting and record keeping must support the data that's included in your drawdown requests and your requests for reimbursements in your um, other financial progress reports. And then ultimately we turn around and we, as the city of Kalamazoo, create something called the CAPER, the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. And that is reporting on what both the city has done directly with HUD funds and also what the subrecipients of the city have done with HUD funds. So we rely on your um, record keeping as well to substantiate what we are then in turn reporting. Uh, this is just a brief <laughs> introduction to things. There's always going to be additional regulations. Just a couple of them that are relevant that really, again, we would be getting into more um, if you had a specific project that you were interested in. But one thing to keep in mind is if you are using CDBG funds and you invest, uh, there's a CDBG investment in like um, building something, for instance, or a real property of more than 25000 if you then change what that property is used for, what that real property is used for within, um, I believe it's five years, uh, there are going to be regulations around what you can do. So if you get, you know, a certain amount of money to, um, you know, to replace, uh, to renovate a community center, right? And then three years later, you say like, actually, we don't want to use this as a community center anymore. You can't just choose what you want without kind of working with the city and working to make sure that we're doing a HUD eligible activity because there's basically considered a HUD investment in that real property and that we have to make sure that uh, we're following guidelines on what what we're doing. Now, the other thing that is relevant to consider for nonprofits that are larger and are thinking about getting federal funds is that 
any organization or company which ex any organization that expends 750,000 or more in federal awards during your fiscal year. So whether that's from one grant or 20 grants, if the total altogether is 750,000 or more, you are subject to a single or program specific audit. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you don't need to know unless you get close to that, and then you need to make the decision about whether it's worth it to you because there are basically additional. Um, it's just it's it's an extra level of audit, so <laughs> you have to make sure that you're ready for that level of scrutiny, right? And to and that there's going to be the additional expense of the single audit, all of that. So it's just a matter of what you have the capacity for. So you should, as an organization, be aware that any funds that you receive for CDBG or home are part of what you um, determine, what part of what is your CFA, your schedule of expenditures of federal awards um, as part of your 990, and that that will be a part of determining whether you are subject to a single audit. Um, finally, there are other federal cross-cutting requirements. Those were covered in prior units. There's always much more that can be said. Again, the basic idea is that this is an overview of basic financial management principles, but there's always going to be other things that are relevant to financial management. As I mentioned in April, there's going to be a procurement standards, um, procurement procedures training. Uh, you have things like in construction projects with um, a certain number of units receiving uh, CBG or home funds. There's going to be prevailing wages, standards, things like that. So. This is just, you know, an introduction. It's important to remember that there's always going to be layers of um, federal cross-cutting requirements and that we can help guide you on things that we think might be relevant, um, but that it is part of it, determining whether you have the capacity to receive federal funds is to think about as you get larger amounts of money, there are going to be more requirements as you um, receive any amount of money there's going to be just certain requirements for what uh, what it means to receive federal funds and that you're receiving it from the city it's as a subrecipient of the city receiving those federal funds so those guidelines are in place for you so now after me talking for way too long i just wanted to open up if there are any questions in the chat uh, you can, if you do have any questions, you can put them in the chat and then Alex will let me know and hopefully only give me softballs. So. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ellie. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give a minute just in case anyone wants to type anything up. Um, there weren't any questions during the presentation. Um, if you have questions after the fact that you still need answered, uh, we have our email address here, cpedcompliance at kalamazoocity.org. That is um, an email that you can always feel free to send questions to, and one of the compliance staff will be will be happy to answer them. Um, it looks like Mary might be typing something up, but um, other than that, uh, thank you, Ellie, for the uh, great presentation. Um, We'll we'll give another minute just in case anyone has any questions. Good question. I can only uh, see the first so, part of it, but um, it's good. <laughs> yeah. So Mary asked, can you just clarify match documentation requirements for volunteer labor? I will be honest, for volunteer labor specifically, I would need to to refer to the text before I gave you a definitive answer. Um, I will pivot from that. So I, I'll follow up with you, Mary, on that, because I, I do want to look at that and make sure that I'm giving you an, a truly accurate answer before I say that. Um, generally, though, one thing that is important is some, uh, uh, a number of our subrecipient agreements, if you receive CDBG or home funds, are going to include a match requirement, which means that we require you as your organization to, um, or your company to basically contribute some amount of your dollars or another funder's dollars that are going to you to um, uh, your, to this project or to eligible expenses. So, and one thing to know is that any match contribution needs to be on expenses that would otherwise basically be 
um, eligible for reimbursement, right? So they would need to be allowable expenses. They would need to meet the same uh, documentation for uh, any other expense. Volunteer labor is one of those tricky ones because that, that's technically not what I just said, um, but I know there are some allowances for basically uh, calculating what the equivalent cost of volunteer labor would be and then using that as a match contribution. And I will follow up with you, Mary, on that because I just don't want to give an answer that I'm not 100% sure on. That wasn't my softball question, but I appreciate it because I should have thought about covering match contributions anyway. Um, Kathy, yes, uh, the presentation slides will be available on our web page. Um, I will send out the link to that web page in my next email on the Lunch and Learns, and uh, we'll have recordings of the presentation as well. So, um, Unless anyone has a last minute question. We will. Um, no problem. We uh, will end our uh, our third HUD grant fundamentals presentation there. Next month we'll be covering income verification, reporting and record keeping um, a really good um, uh, sort of offset of the presentation we've had today and uh, we hope to see you all there. So thank you again for showing up and have a great day.